I've been sitting here for what feels like forever trying to figure out the best way to describe to you what I just saw. I just returned from NIAR, which is a research facility on the WSU campus in Wichita, Kansas. The engineering that they're doing at this place is simply incredible. Everything from crash sleds for testing safety devices, there's full scale structural testing. They have a digital twin project, which is literally reverse engineering an entire military aircraft piece by piece. They have multi-robot cells where they're testing out new industrial applications. There's a Formula One style SAE racing team. There's so much stuff I'm gonna have to break this up into a series. Quite literally, I'm just gonna have to ask you to trust me that what you're about to see is simply amazing. You clicked on the thumbnail, so you know this video is all about the SAE team. We're gonna head over there, take a look at their car, and let's talk to the team about what it takes to build something like this. I feel like I should start by admitting up front that I had no idea that this industrial powerhouse of research <laughs> was in Wichita, Kansas. It was only because of one of my favorite sponsors, really, Dassault Systems. They have a lab on this campus and they were telling me about this facility and what happens there. And I said, man, I, I really want to go see this place. And so uh, they're the ones who allowed me to peek behind the curtain. They, get, they gave me all the right contacts. And you're going to notice that there are a few other people, you know, who are tagging along, so to speak. It, it was interesting to me to see how uh, packages like Katia and SolidWorks and Delmia are used in these different branches of industry and the places where they where they overlap and where they work together and how they're different. So anyway, I'll tell you more about the sponsor later in the video. This That's not what this is. I just wanted to acknowledge up front that they're the ones who opened this door and gave me access to these places you don't normally get to see. Okay, so let's jump right in with the SAE team and let's talk about this Formula One style car that they built. This is the Shocker Racing Team space at WSU. We build that car right over there. So it's called a Formula SAE car. We do road racing on an autocross course. We do an acceleration run and we do a skid pad run that tests the lateral acceleration of the car. And we compete against other universities across the country and overseas as well. We have one main competition every year. This year it was in Michigan. There were 120 other teams that have cars very similar to ours. We follow a very lengthy, I think it's, how long is the rule book? Yeah, so a really long rule book. <laughs> so we have a lot of requirements we have to follow. And then we present our designs to professionals in racing industry, aerospace industry, and they critique our designs and tell us what we did good and what we did wrong and how we can improve in the future. If you guys want to come take yeah, a look so at the car. Yeah, so let's take a look at the car. The whole point of it is to mimic a Formula One style car. So obviously it's a single passenger car. Uh, we have restrictions on our engine size, so we're limited to 710 cc's. Okay. Um, most teams are right around that mark. We currently have a Honda CBR 600 RR. It's a street bike motor. Full aero package, rear wing, front wing is our aero package. It just increases downforce on the car, allows us to go around corners a lot faster. A lot of design go work goes into that. That's what a lot of the aerospace majors do. Now, some of you may be wondering, what does aerospace have to do with a race car? Well, in this case, this car literally has two wings on it, except they're flipped upside down. The same way that an airplane uses its wings to create lift as it accelerates down the runway, this car literally uses its wings to create a downforce or lift, but upside down in order to create more traction. And this basically allows the car to deliver more power to the road to get the forward movement that you want, especially in turns. So where do you guys hide the nitrous bottle? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got one. Yeah, we wish, we wish. Of the rules, yeah. yeah. You can't store nitrous in the yeah. cage. No, so you can, you are allowed to turbocharge these or supercharge them, but the thing with it is it makes the system a lot more complicated and you can't just throw a turbocharger on it. You have to tell the judges what size turbocharger, why you do it, how it hurts you, how it helps you. You have to prove it through an engineering process. Okay. So that's the whole point of this. It's more of an engineering competition rather than a racing competition. Okay, I had to break in here and just make a quick comment that first, this is my buddy Matt from SolidWorks who's asking the question. And then his response is fantastic. And as someone who is constantly talking about engineering decisions on the internet, I frequently get questions like, why don't you just make it out of titanium? Why don't you just make the motor bigger? Why don't you just add a supercharger? And that's what engineering really is. There's always a trade-off. If you got a material that happens to be stronger and lighter, it probably costs more. 
or it's more difficult to machine, and so on. There is always a trade-off. I just got so excited because I didn't even know this competition existed until I met these people. And then to find out that there's a there's a whole competition like this built around the concept of uh, doing real engineering, not just racing, but the heart of engineering and figuring out what trade-offs make the most sense to get the optimal performance. So the next question I brought up was, what part do you consider to be the most challenging for you? I'm currently the chief engineer and powertrain lead. So the most challenging part about powertrain for me is designing the intake and the exhaust. So there's a lot of aerodynamics that go along with that and how the air moves through them and the different pressure waves that move through the engine to make it perform the best it can. Regarding budget, is there a, is there a cap on what you can spend? There's not a cap on it but we only get so much funding from the university and okay all of all the rest of our funding is kind of just what we get off of other people outside of the university and so it's 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 hard to find funding sometimes but we do get some help from other areas it's solidworks where the finance of cash i bet there'd be a song on the sticker Yep. Oh yeah. Oh man. Have, Wait, is there one? Hold on. We got, we got a little one right there. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We have to sell some. I know a guy. Yeah. What you guys are using to model this up? Yeah, so we'll take you guys upstairs in a minute, but we model everything in SolidWorks. So one of our big goals this year was to have a complete assembly so we could take that assembly, every single bolt, nut, washer, we could just look at that and know exactly how it goes together. Now, as a longtime SolidWorks user, I really resonated with this idea of having all of your stuff in one place. You know uh, what kind of fasteners you need, you can make your bill of material, your drawings, and all of that stuff is contained right there in SolidWorks. But what I hadn't experienced until recently was the 3D Experience platform. This also happens to be the sponsor for today's video. What I wanna tell you about this platform is how it combines so many tools that we need to do our job in one place. Not only do you already have all the powerful tools that are built into SolidWorks, but when you connect it to the 3D Experience platform, you're adding a whole new level of simulation, data management, machining, marketing, collaboration between team members. It's just amazing the number of tools that you have at your disposal. Now, I've been tinkering with this for about two years now, but I really got immersed at the beginning of the year when I started my Doctor Who project. And if you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link in the description. But I was working with a huge team of guys spread all over the United States, and we we were able to collaborate with each other in real time, sharing 3D models, sharing data. The power of having all of your 3D models, your manufacturing data, and full revision control all in one place is really quite powerful. If you're one of those people who has five different versions of a model saved and each one is laying final, 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 final revision, <laughs> That is not gonna cut it in the big leagues, my friend. It's time to step up the game and get full revision control so that you have a single source of truth and you know which model is truly the final model. There's a bunch of other things as well, like you can share your 3D models by just sharing a link. By far, one of my favorite features is being able to run simulations in the cloud. Now I don't have to tie up my workhorse computer all day long. I've essentially got a supercomputer in the cloud running a simulation and I can continue to model and work while the simulation is being done and it's all secure and protected. Anyway, if you're only using SolidWorks, you are missing out on a lot of really powerful tools. You can connect your desktop version of SolidWorks to the cloud today, or you can start with a 3D Experience SolidWorks, which is basically the same tool, it's just already in the cloud. This gives you access to all of these powerful tools from any browser anywhere in the world, it's pretty hard to beat that. So here's the bottom line. You can have one single source of truth where all of your team members, all of your data, and all of your applications are securely stored in one place. I, I think you should check it out. If you wanna get started or you just want more details, click on the link in the description. Talk to me about composites. So I see you have uh, carbon fiber, obviously, and it, are you guys working on that together? Or how? Tell me about your yeah, the so process here. Composites, I'm the composites lead. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, huge task for our team, um, mainly because of manufacturing, right? So yeah. um, all of our composites we make with foam molds. So we try to use tooling foam, medium density. If we can afford it, we'd like high density, um, depending on the sponsorships that we get. So we'll route all of okay. those out, gel coat them, put release on them and everything. And we all do the layups back there and we can take you over there um, yeah. to see our composite station. Um, so yes, we do all of the layups by hand. Um, unfortunately, due to budget restrictions, we didn't have a whole lot of carbon to work with last year. So we didn't get to retry some of the layups. Um, so if you see that side pod kind of has that wrinkle in it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a very meticulous process. Uh, carbon's one of those things where 
you can't skimp out on the previous step because it will affect you, right? If you do the first yeah. step at 90% and you do the rest at 100, the, the best you're gonna get is a 90% result. So I yeah. mean, you have to be very meticulous on every single step. The main focus of our team currently is to kind of build on the last year's car and improve okay. it instead of starting from scratch. So this coming year, we're currently in the design phase. So we pretty much start with this car. Yep. We sit down and pick out a list of things that we didn't really like about it. So we're, we're in a really good spot there because a lot of the things on this car are really good, but there's a handful of things that we really don't like. Uh, specifically for next year, we're really gonna focus on quality manufacturing. So what is the typical speed for a vehicle like this, this uh, racing? So like I said earlier, we do autocross, which is real short, tight technical corners and short straights. On those types of courses, we most likely won't get above 50. We could go faster if we had more space. Yeah, I think top speed we calculated is about a little over 100. That's if we have a long ways to go and a while to get up to it. So this brings up another interesting question, which is optimizing for acceleration rather than top speed, right? Yeah. Because you'd wanna, you're slowing down in a corner, you wanna get back up yeah. as fast as you can. I think that's kind of something that we're gonna work with a little bit more this year. Uh, because that really comes down to like our aerodynamics, right? In acceleration, you don't want a whole lot of downforce because, well, you, you want, you know, the happy medium. You want enough downforce that you have traction when you take off, but you don't want to have so much downforce that's slowing you down. Okay, so the downforce is lower at lower speeds, right? Because you don't have as much air flowing over. And if the top end is 50 miles an hour-ish in a race, then at what point does downforce start to become a factor that you're even so considering it? That'd be more of a question for our Lee that's not here, but oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think his goal was to study aerodynamics around like the 20 to 30 mile an hour range yeah. and really try to optimize the wings for that speed and then not really pay too much attention at the higher speeds and yeah. not too much at the lower speeds because at the lower speeds, it's really hard to produce downforce. Right. So So who, who drives this? After you're part of the team for, I think it's three months, you become an active member. Once you're an active member, anybody can drive. So. Is there anybody particularly better skilled at this? Who, who's the best driver? I probably have the most experience <laughs> in the car. Um, I've just been, I've driven it the most. I notice you guys have coilovers on each corner. How much do you play with suspension geometry, valving, all this kind of stuff? Suspension is honestly our biggest challenge because of how complex of a system it is. Um, so that's kind of just an iterative process. We go out and test, we make little tweaks here and there, we get driver feedback. Because this is fully adjustable, so we can do tow, camber, change the spring rates, ride height. We can change anything we want to change. It's just, there's so much to change. It's hard to get what's good and what's bad. And I mean, but that's what makes it such a great application for teaching engineering because there, there's constantly so many levers that you can push up and down to yep. get that sweet spot. And everybody can find a slightly different variation. So that's another thing that I, I love about this. One really cool thing about this is it's really like open community. So you can reach out to any team and they'll give you, a lot of people write research papers on like real specific niche things yeah. and they'll just give them to you like so for the the intake up there there are entire like 50 60 page research papers on just the volume on the inside of that how yeah. big it is so it's really good because i could just say oh this guy said this was good i'm going to do that or i could go in and write my own research paper and spend two three years on it yeah. it's just how much time you want to spend and how much you want to get out of it really can we talk about the shape of that is that top secret? No. Okay. <laughs> so. Is it single throttle body, right? Yep. To four intake ports? Yep. So on the inside of there, I can show you when we get upstairs a little, okay. there's velocity stacks on the inside of there. So they're just little yep. trumpets. What I did with that actually is I made three different versions of this. One didn't have any fancy geometry in it. One had baffles that divided it up into like four quadrants. And then one also had those velocity stacks. So we went to the dyno and threw each one of them on there and see which one did the best. The velocity stacks did the best. So in my final design, I incorporated that. So that's 3D printed out of Altum 9085. It's an aerospace grade 3D printed plastic. So it has a really high temperature resistance. I think it's 370C is its uh, deformation temperature, yeah. which is a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right next to exhaust. Yeah. 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 And it's also really strong, so it's kind of surprising that uh, inside of that plenum it almost pulls an absolute vacuum yeah. because of the air sucking down the engine and our restrictor here that's required by the rules. So we had to have something really strong so it didn't collapse because we actually had one that we were running the engine and it just flattened itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 
So this, this right here is the restrictor. Yeah, so this point right here is 20 millimeters inside diameter. So that's, okay. that's really small. That's, yeah. I don't know, like that. That's the main power restriction. So we can't yeah. make something that's a thousand horsepower and 400 pounds and be extremely yeah. dangerous. Yeah. 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 So that's pretty much the only engine side restriction that we have other than safety rules here and there. And then you just have to work around those two things to get the most out of it. Say it again. We can start the car for you. Dude! So... <laughs> I need to pop in here and first give you a noise warning because this thing is really loud. And also I want you to notice this guy. His name is Tony. He's a part of the Del Mio team at uh, Dassault Systems. And I want you to notice how he's been quietly watching, but after they inject this room with testosterone from cranking this car, he just comes alive with questions. And uh, you'll see what I mean. Smells like horsepower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is yeah. it burn, yeah. man? Uh, 93 octane. Yeah. Is that so. that's a rule? Okay. Whoa. So we can either run 93, 110, or E85. A lot of teams run E85, but then there's rules specific to E85. There's different engine restrictions. So like the that restrictor I was talking about. For E85, there's a smaller restrictor. A lot that goes into changing over to a different fuel. We could probably just go right to 110 octane it's just hard to get so okay and so did you engine dyno it or did you chassis dyno it we chassis dyno okay cool so you, you got the numbers on that yeah so currently it makes about 68 horsepower okay and i think it was 38 foot pounds of torque pretty uh, respectable yeah what'd you say 400 pounds what's the uh currently this car is just under 500 pounds okay so. I wanted to point this out because I think it says a lot about the way we teach engineering. He's probably the oldest person in the room, right? He's not ancient or anything like that, but the average age in the room was much lower than his age. And if he can be excited about something like this, imagine what this does for our students when we put them in front of a car. I think we need more programs like this. Don't just hand your students one math book after the other, calculus one, calculus two, calculus three, physics one, physics two, physics three graduate. Engineering is so much more exciting than math. Not that math is not interesting to some people. My point is we need programs like this and this takes money. So there's my soapbox. We got to invest in programs like this if we want more people to graduate with STEM degrees and be excited about engineering. Can I sit inside? Yeah, go for it. All right. <clears throat> is there any place I'm not supposed to put my feet? Oh gosh. Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. And then oh boy. Sitting right on the floor. Okay. <laughs> so then you just pull that back a little bit. All right. And you kind of just got to, yep, there you yep. go. And then, so your shifter. Oh man, perfect. That's your shifter right there. Okay. So your clutch lever's here. So you have to pull this in to pull, engage the clutch. And then this just moves forward and back to shift gears. Dude, hurling at 50 miles an hour, laying right on the floor like this is insane. Yep. <laughs> That is wild. So when we're in there, we have a, it's a six point harness in there. Okay. So you have, there's four straps down there. There's one that goes underneath your leg and wraps around. And there's another one that's like a lap Wow, belt. okay. Yeah, so at competition, like you were saying, you have to egress in five seconds. So you pretty much just have to rip the steering wheel off, hit the e-stop, flip that switch and get both feet on the ground in five seconds. Full racing suit, helmet, gloves, yep. What do I, what kind of information do I normally have on display here? So up at the top there is RPM. Yeah. So that just comes across the screen just in a band. And then we also have these lights that correspond with the RPM. Yep. 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 So then we have our battery voltage, which is currently dying. <laughs> um, you actually can't see a lot of it with the, uh, you'd have yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. We have a different steering wheel and I don't know what the, vis the vision like on that one is. If you want to try that one. Sure. So that's one we designed in house. Yep, there, there we go. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. More visibility, but I agree, yeah. yeah it's a little tougher to Yeah. Use. All right, so how, uh, I, well, I can, I'll come on out. All right, pop that. 
Okay, you stop. Okay. Oh. There you go. You do that in under five seconds. Yeah, it, it takes some practice yeah. for me to do that. <laughs> um, we have it set up so whenever, anytime the engine starts, it starts recording data. Okay. So then you just pull it off the ECU and you can scroll through it and it has timestamps. Tells you anything you could possibly imagine that you needed to know about the engine. Yeah. A lot of stuff we don't even really need to know. Yeah. <laughs> so you can pick out if something went wrong at approximately here, you can look back through and see exactly what went wrong. Or, yeah. yeah. But there is a noise restriction. For the car. <laughs> I was going to say, that's pretty loud already. It's like <laughs> so it has to be under 110 decibels. Currently it's not because it's no fun. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> And the way we passed sound test, we had to pack steel wool down into that tube. Yeah. Um, and it worked really well. Up yeah. Shot <laughs> yeah. 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 It's funny because uh, it'll be noise tested competition will open up, and then over the loudspeakers, it'll be like, Michigan State University needs steel wool and sound test. <laughs> and just like a whole bunch of teams asking for steel wool to shove down in their exhaust so they can pass. Well, do you guys want to go upstairs and we'll show you the CAD stuff? Yeah. Hold that right like, it's all right. Okay, so we'll start, we'll start at this computer. This right here is our master assembly. So every component that's down there on that car is in CAD. As you can see, the aero package, the front wing and the rear wing look a little bit different in CAD than they were down there. Um, so we have all the bolts and nuts and washers to connect everything. Each individual subteam will have their own assembly like this with all of their components in it so that anybody could open that up in SOLIDWORKS, pick whatever they wanted to put together. All of those components would be in there. So I can just write down, I need however many nuts, however many bolts to put the intake together, write down a little list, take it downstairs and get it all put together. We can then, once we get that manufactured, we can compare what actually got manufactured to how it was designed. Even compare weights, because we can pull the weights off these parts. All these parts have materials on them. So we can see how much SolidWorks told us those headers were supposed to weigh, ideally. And then we can go weigh the headers and see, oh, we put a ton of weld on this. We added two pounds in weight in just welds. Yeah. We need to figure out a better way to weld that so we can reduce weight. So when you make engineering changes, is it a democratic process? Is there a, a design dictator? Like, how does it? Yeah. So we have a we have a chief engineer. I'm one of them. We have two actually. But uh, this year, like I was mentioning, we're improving last year's car to make the new one. So we have a form that we fill out to do a change request. I want to make the headers to exit the other side of the car. It still follows this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, and then I can list out what su other sub teams that will affect. Is there somebody responsible for making sure? each change complies with all of the rules? Like how do you manage uh, compliance? That's a really big task. Yeah. So like we said, it's the 300 page rule book. So yeah. the responsibility- That's, that's why I yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the responsibility first falls on the, the sub team lead. It's okay. their responsibility to do their best to follow the rules. And then the chief engineers go back in and double check them and, and approve their design. Cause we're trying to follow how a company works. And when are you gonna send parts out? You get to practice drafting skills, GDT, those kinds of things within SOLIDWORKS drawings? Yep, so how we do that, we use the SOLIDWORKS drafting and then we'll take that with us and sit down with the manufacturer. Uh, so usually one of the chief engineers and then whoever designed the part will go and sit down with the manufacturer, present our drawing, present our part, and then ask them what changes need to be made. So it's really cool when we do that because a lot of us are just learning. There's not really a class that specifically tells us this manufacturer wants you to do it this way. Because yeah. every manufacturer is a little bit different. For us, they're usually doing these parts for free. So if we tell them we want like a ten, one tenth out tolerance on this part, they're like, do you really need that? Why do you need that? Most of the time we don't. But if we did, we would have to present to them exactly why we needed it because that just spikes the cost. It's a lot of learning about tolerancing, like what's actually necessary, what can we go without. You guys were talking about drawings. There's a drawing right behind you over here. We have to submit these full car drawings for our competition. One of the side competitions is whoever makes the best drawings, it get, they get put on a shirt. And then everybody at the next competition gets that shirt with your drawing on it. Okay. So this drawing, if we were the best one, would go on a shirt. 
Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, one of the best things about being on this team is the real world experience. Yeah. Like yeah. it's it really helps you see what industry is like compared to you know just taking a class over yeah. one specific thing. Good. And in and, and classes, it always works out. You're like, yeah. oh, you get this answer. That's correct. Cool. <laughs> But we know in real life, it doesn't quite work out that way, right? I look forward to seeing how their careers progress and where they end up going after this. I think all of them are showing some amazing potential. So anyway, if you want to invest in their team, I'll put some links in the description for you. You can find out more information or send a donation or whatever. But reach out to these guys because it, it takes money to do this kind of stuff. And we're going to continue on with part two of this episode. This series is not over. There's going to be a link right here on the screen. You can click on it and find out more about robotics. That link is right there. Thank you so much to So Systems for uh, sponsoring this series. There's a link. Click on it. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.